Welcome to The Real News. I'm Jess Lenore. Maryland Governor Larry Hogan is a popular Republican in a deeply Democratic state who believes in climate change, has criticized Donald Trump, and handily won re-election during the 2018 midterms, where Democrats made major gains. But Hogan and Trump do have at least one thing in common, besides being Republicans, of course. Corruption. Because they both use their positions of power for personal gain, argues The Washington Monthly's Eric Cordelessa. Hogan steered millions in state road construction money to areas where his company owned property, whose values were certain to rise. Like Trump, Hogan has given control of his companies to close relatives, his brother. The Hogan administration says he complied with state ethics laws because he was never personally involved in decisions approving the projects. But Cordelessa writes at least one government official disputes these claims, saying it, quote, doesn't pass the laugh test. While the governor has expanded highways to the benefit of suburban landowners like himself, he killed the multi-billion dollar red line, a huge blow to Baltimore's working class black neighborhoods, which have endured disinvestment for generations. The NAACP's civil rights lawsuit against the cancellation of the red line was dismissed by the Trump administration. Well, now joining us to discuss this is Eric Cordelessa of the Washington Monthly, author of the piece, Who Does Maryland's Governor Really Work For?, Larry Hogan has more in common with Donald Trump than his reputation suggests, and her own Lisa Snowden, who also runs the Baltimore Beat. Thank you both for joining us. Good to be here. So, Eric, um, you spent months reporting on this article, um, and you you acknowledge you built on reporting that other publications sort of started, but you took it further than other places had before. Um, Talk about what you found in this piece, uh, over over this course of months you spent on it. Sure, sure. Well, before I had started, there were really two main articles that had been written about the governor's real estate business, one in Maryland Matters and one in the Baltimore Sun. Uh, The Maryland Matters story came first, and that really built off of financial disclosure forms that the governor had submitted to the State Ethics Commission, which included sort of the real estate LLCs that are subsidiaries of the Hogan Company, that, in, that if you went through public land records, you could find some of the properties that they own. There are limits to that, by the way, because LLCs are notoriously non-transparent. They're cloaked in secrecy. The only public information about an LLC is its resident agent. You don't know who the partners are. You don't know what the operating agreement entails. And you certainly don't know if they are the minority owner in a property. So there's a lot that we don't know about the governor's real estate business. Um, But what the Maryland Matters story did was it laid out the LLCs that he had uh, ownership of at the time. The story came out in 2018 and included some concerns from Democrats and a few ethics experts about the arrangement. The governor had not put his uh, real estate holdings in a blind trust. The governor put his brother in charge of the company. And uh, the governor obviously has a great deal of executive authority when it comes to transportation and other matters, giving out government contracts, et cetera. So what my story did was it really delved into the very specific transportation decisions the governor made that had posed to benefit his real estate company. And the main way that the governor does that through is through the annual transportation budget. In Maryland, it's called the Consolidated Transportation Program. It's a rolling budget that the governor puts out every year that's supposed to last for six years. And uh, what I found through an extensive look at those documents was that there were a number of instances in which he advanced projects that were right nearby properties he he owned. And one thing to to make clear is that it is the governor's authority to move projects up or down in the transportation budget. I spoke to a number of former and current officials in Maryland's Department of Transportation, and it's very clear nothing can move up in the transportation budget without the governor's signing off on it at the very least. Um, One of the first big things he did in 2015 upon taking office, as you say, was he killed the red line. That was a $2.9 billion dollar project aimed to bring, uh, you know, mass transit to Baltimore. There was a lot of, there was hundreds of thousands of dollars in sunken costs. It was already put into the construction program by uh, Hogan's predecessor, Martin O'Malley, and it had a $900 million guarantee in federal aid from the Obama administration. The governor killed that program, killed that, the red line, and by doing that, he freed up a lot of money to spend on roads, highways, and bridges. One of the first things he did was he greenlit the construction of an interchange in Brandywine, Maryland. He allocated $58 million for that project to go forward. That was a decision that he made. Meanwhile, he's got a number of real estate interests right nearby. He had a parcel of land 
uh, right down the road. And since then, he has increased his investment and also increased other projects in the area, including a new bridge, embankments, a park and ride, et cetera. So, you know, as the Hogan administration has been investing heavily in transportation infrastructure in Brandywine, he's also been investing heavily through his private real estate business. There are other instances, too. Uh, he bought a property a parcel of land in Hyattsville, Maryland in 2015. Come 2017, he approved $23.5 million in road and sidewalk improvements right next to it, essentially, on uh, Maryland Route 500. Um, that was something that he did. One thing he also did was uh, in between running, in between his, ele his election and assuming office, he went and bought a parcel of land from the State Highway Administration, which he's now developing into an uh, apartment complex and uh, residential facility. Uh, now it's advertised on his site that he's brokering it for, for $2.4 million. So what the story really did was get into the specifics of transportation decisions he made that benefited his private real estate business while in office. Um, so Hogan says... He hadn't, spoken with, he hadn't spoken with you directly, but through his administration, he says he's complied with ethics laws, that his companies are in a trust, and that he hasn't approved, he hasn't personally approved any of these road projects. That, that's, that's what his response has been um, to, to, the, to your reporting. Um, how, how, did, how did your reporting flesh out? How, how did it, what did you find? Are, are those, did those things stack up? Well, the first thing that he hasn't made the decisions, um, you know, I had a Maryland Department of Transportation official say that that wasn't true, mm -hmm. that it didn't pass the last laugh test. Uh, Warren Deschanel, who is the longtime director of the Annapolis's Department of Legislative Services, called it a ridiculous assertion because the governor has the most broadest, most powerful authority over transportation compared to any other governor in the nation because they have the sole authority to move projects up or down on the, on the Consolidated Transportation Program, as I said. And uh, Maryland Department of Transportation officials say, no, that's not true. The governor did sign off on these decisions. Someone told me on background. The notion that he doesn't make decisions, by the way, belies a million things he said while in office. He's taken, first of all, a tooth fairy didn't kill the red line, right? Governor Hogan did it. Second of all, the governor took credit for advancing the Purple Line into construction when that had been an engineering under the O'Malley administration. It only went into construction because the governor made that decision. And it's the same principle with all of these other decisions. His uh, communications director said that to me when I've been reporting the story, but since it's come out, he hasn't been repeating that claim. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a reason for that. And so there's that. You look at the uh, ethics disclosure forms, there's a lot of information that's not there that state legislators that I talked to said they needed to know before voting on this transportation project and unwittingly approving projects that were going to, you know, boost the profits of the governor's private real estate business. So, for instance, here are things you, you don't, don't know on governor's financial disclosure form. Mm -hmm. He lists the LLCs that he has ownership in, but he doesn't list the specific properties that they're involved with or the dates of acquisition. Mm. That's a really big problem, right? Because all it is is a schedule of, you know, the 43 LLCs he has ownership in, but we don't actually know what properties that they uh, are involved with. Um, you have to do a lot of digging, and there's a lot of stuff that you don't know even if you do comb through public land records because, of course, if they're the minority owner in a property that's only going to be in an LLC operating agreement, it's not going to be in the public land records. The other thing is that one thing that the Hogan administration does is it acts as a broker on deals. Mm. And what that means is that he's bringing in a lot of private income on undisclosed brokerage fees. The governor is in charge of regulating the real estate business in Maryland in a whole host of ways. He gives out contracts for a whole bunch of different projects, including like on the Brandywine Interchange. He gave it to Ficina Construction, which was a big campaign contributor. But a concern that I heard from legislators and Maryland government officials, past and present, was that he is getting paid by real estate developers all across the state, and the public doesn't know who they are. Mm. What contracts have they gotten? What favors have they gotten? These are things that we don't know. And what it really shows is that there is a vacuum, a hole in the state ethics laws or the disclosure requirements that could make sure that the government isn't using his public office for personal financial gain. Mm. Um, so Lisa, uh, you know, some have argued that, you know, and, and a lot has been made about Hogan's popularity. Mm -hmm. And some have argued, and there was a recent piece in the New Republic by Alex Parine, who argued he is, he is popular precisely because he is willing to take resources from, from black neighborhoods in Baltimore that would have benefited from the red line. 
and use that money to invest highways um, into the, some of the wealthiest suburban counties in the country. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, while he's claiming to believe in climate change, he's expanding, you know, road infrastructure. What, do you, what are your thoughts on that? So, yeah, I think that Larry Hogan is very much aware of racial tropes in this country, uh, racial dog whistles. You see that in the way that, you know, when Donald Trump called Baltimore rat infested, it was very hard for us to, in Baltimore, you know, media here to get him to really refute that. I think that Donald Trump said that on like a weekend and he finally got around to saying something about it Monday. Um, he very much leaves on, leans on heavy, you know, crime tropes and saying more policing after the uh, uprising that happened the death, following the death of Freddie Gray. He was willing to kind of let the National Guard in and that's something that he even ran on. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that it's something that happened way before Larry Hogan was born. This country's kind of, in our, in our DNA is the idea that people of color should have little and white people should have lots. And, and, but I think it's something that is right in his playbook and that he's willing to very much use. And um, Eric, how have lawmakers responded in the wake of this, in, this, uh, in your story? Um, many, including, many people you spoke to, including the current the, the now uh, Senate president said they weren't aware of these conflicts when they voted on these uh, transportation deals. And, and so that was, and so that's now Senate President Bill Ferguson. I know he's made some comments as well as um, the Speaker of the House, Adrian Jones, have made comments on what the, the legislator, uh, the uh, you know, General Assembly is going to do as far as tackling um, these p possible ethics violations. At the same time, they still need to work together with Hogan to get their agenda passed. Right. I mean, it's, it's one thing to note is that we go into this session with two new presiding officers who don't have the same sort of institutional knowledge that their predecessors had had, and that would have been beneficial to dealing with revelations such as this. Um, the, you know, the reaction that I heard from legislators was that they didn't really know, you know, they knew that he had a real estate business, but they didn't know the extent to which he had made decisions that posed conflicts of interest and I know that there are a bunch of them who would like to see an investigation from the General Assembly. Uh, Speaker of the House Adrian Jones had indicated that a subcommittee was going to look into this and uh, was also going to be forward thinking when reviewing the more recent transportation budget that is going to be released today. Mm. Um, Senator Bill Ferguson, who when I spoke to him was extremely alarmed mm. and wanted an investigation from the General Assembly. Now he's saying he believes it's under the purview of the State Ethics Commission. Uh, but I know that there are many members of both the Senate and the House caucus who are concerned about this and want follow-up and want questions that are going to be answered. You saw a number of them tweet that out the day the story came out, including Baltimore's own Brooke Learman. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would expect there to be a lot more scrutiny on the current transportation budget that he's proposing. Whether or not there's going to be a backward-looking investigation into past decisions, I don't know. But I know that a bunch of legislators want this to be dealt with because it hasn't in the past. All right, we're almost out of time, but Lisa, um, I wanted to end with you uh, and ask you, um, how does, so talk about your thoughts, I know you've commented this a lot <laughs> online, but your thoughts on, you know, obviously Eric's great work here, mm -hmm. um, but the lack of this sort of reporting in the state of Maryland, specifically when it comes to uh, challenging Governor Hogan and even, you know, following up and really asking those tough questions, like, we, have, have we seen that happen in, in the press corps in the state? So I'll start by saying the Maryland Matters piece was written by a former colleague of mine, Eric Erickson, um, you know, kind of a vintage city paper guy. The piece that he would have possibly written for city paper, I'm sure would have been very different than the piece that he wrote for Maryland Matters. And that's saying nothing bad about Maryland Matters, but city paper is kind of rooted in the more confrontational kind of journalism. Mm. And the reason why Ed could not do that is because city paper was closed. So part of the things is that journalism is not what it once was. You know, we have these shrinking newsrooms. We don't have as many bodies on it. But also, you know, the people that we have on these stories now have to be worried about access. Um, and that makes for a weaker government for all of us. Um, and the thing that I'm always going to rant about is anytime you put a camera or a microphone in front of me, is the race factor. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting to me that that New Republic piece that you mentioned, I believe it calls him a crook in the headline. 
you don't ever, you very rarely see... The most popular crook in America. Yes. <laughs> and that's shocking because you don't always, often hear about rich white men being called crooks. Mm. Um, look at the way that this is being covered or not being covered versus here in Baltimore when Catherine Pugh was recently called to the carpet for her involvement with her Healthy Holly books, the book that she was kind of selling to maybe do some more, you know, garner money or favor. Um, it's very different. We had the same local press camped out at her house, camped out everywhere, camped out at her consignment shop. And I think that you have to say, you know, if we're looking at a press that's mostly white, how, we, how do you cover somebody who looks like you versus someone who looks very foreign to you? How do you cover someone that you're like, I can look at them and understand their background and kind of give them the benefit of the doubt versus someone that you know nothing about, that you're, you know, born in this racist country that already tells you black people are bad, lazy, shiftless. And I think that that's a, that's a factor there. And especially when the impacts of these policies are disproportionately impacting uh, working, you know, residents of the city mm -hmm. um, and other working class neighborhoods across the state. Well, I want to thank you both for joining us. Um, Eric Cordelessa will link to your piece, Who Does Maryland's Governor Really Work For, on our website. Thanks so much for joining us. And Lisa, it's always a pleasure having you on. Great. Thanks for having us. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network. Thanks a lot for watching. Appreciate it. Uh, but do us one more solemn favor. Hit the subscribe button below. You know you want to. Stay up on the videos.